Hi everyone, my name is Benjamin, and today's presentation is about trading and investing for the end game. Escape the grinds. Now, what do we mean when we're talking about the end game? Okay, so the end game is just that final point in your life of when you're happy. Okay, that's really as simple as it gets. What is your end game? Is your end game sitting on a cottage, sitting on a deck, having a beer, relaxing with your family, not having to go to work the next day? Or is your end game kind of driving down the Pacific Ocean with your giant super yacht and then 15 people as an entourage and then you're kind of a famous trader? Like, what is it that you want? Especially these days with COVID, more and more people are gravitating toward the first end game, which is just peace and quiet, you and your family, not having to go to work, more time to do your hobbies, more time to do the things that you want to do. But the one thing that they have in common is that they've defined their end game. Now, I use the term end game a lot. I use it when I talk to uh, people at work. I use it when I talk to different traders. I use it when I talk to my family. Um, especially in the early days, it would be a lot of like, a lot of conversation surrounding the end game. Well, what is it that we want? Is this going to help us get to the end game or is this not going to help us get to the end game? And so end game is a really, really popular term that I use. So I thought it'd be a fitting term for this presentation. So I've been with trade doctors now for almost two years and, and they asked me to do a presentation about my trading experience, uh, about my journey and kind of create some sort of blueprint, at least show people who are just starting out. What is it that I did that might have been different than what they've done, right? So my perspective, again, I'm not a multimillionaire. That's not at all what this presentation is about. I'm not going to show you how I went from knowing nothing to knowing everything in a span of two weeks. And now I'm trying to you know, force feed you some sort of information down your throat. Not at all what this presentation is about. It's an absolutely realistic story and a framework. So I've seen a lot of these courses. And again, I... I, I went through a lot of courses just to get an idea of what kind of template I should follow or should I be talking a little bit more about this? Should I be talking a little bit more about that? And one thing that I found that was missing in a lot of these different presentations, whether it was trading, investments, real estate, microgreens, business, whatever it is, I found that the history was missing a lot of the times. It's more people going from zero to hero and then they're spending the time talking about being a hero versus that grind, that really difficult part of the journey that a lot of people struggle with. So that's what today is about. I'm going to take you step by step through my experience. And one thing that I want to really mention to you and highlight is that every piece of information that I'm going to share with you today, you can verify it online. Now, if I'm talking about designations, you can look up my name online and you'll see that I do have designations and you'll see which ones I have. If we're talking about real estate, all of the addresses of the different real estate properties that I've purchased are listed at the top of the presentations. So you can look them up and you can find out who the owner of those properties are. So maximum transparency is what I'm trying to go for today. We're talking about trading performance. We're talking about real estate portfolio. We're talking about real journeys, real hardships. Those things are verifiable. And that's the kind of the one thing that I want you to remember. So defined endgame from the official Merriam-Webster is just the final stage of some action or process, which we've covered in detail. So a little bit about what we're going to cover today. Again, we're really going to focus about the history of how I got where I am today, but also what kind of key decisions I made throughout that process. We're going to discuss mentorship and how that was probably one of the most influential things in my life that guided me to where I am today again, but kind of that crucial pinnacle moment in life where something big happened in my life and I was like, this is what I want to do. This is my passion. This is what I'm going to attack. And um, so we'll discuss a little bit about that in detail. And then we're going to go through a lot of learning curves. Now, everybody's learning curve is going to be a little bit different. So a learning curve is essentially the steeper the curve, the more difficult that is going to be for someone. For example, if someone studied marine biology and then you're going to be learning about finance, that's going to be a steeper learning curve than somebody who went to school to be an actuary or an actuary is somebody who prices insurance, but let's just say somebody who went to school for finance and then started going through that process and started to learn about trading. That's going to be a little bit more flat, a little bit easier, right? So everybody's got a little bit of a different background, but at the end of the day, learning curves are going to be there for anything that you decide to learn. It's normal. It's part of, it's part of the process. A big part of, I guess you can say the success that I've had is about changing my mindset from looking for ways of how to make money, looking for good investment opportunities. And when you're looking for those things, you're actually too late. You should be looking for good investment opportunities because that means those people have already solved the problem and you're kind of getting in one step too late. 
you should be looking for problems because if you're able to fix problems, the money is going to come on its own. If you find the cure for cancer, for example, cancer is a problem. If you find the cure for cancer, you're not going to have to worry about money, right? So changing your mindset from not looking from uh, not looking for solutions or not looking for things that are already done, but go find those problems and then see if your particular skill set can fix that problem. And if it can, well, you just hit a jackpot, right? But start seeking problems instead of trying to find opportunities. At the end of everything, you've gone through your whole life experience. You've gone through your different learning curves. You have a very clear idea of what you want to do in terms of an end game. Once you get to that point, you got to systemize and you got to diversify. If you put all your eggs in one basket, you're very, very exposed. And that's like rule 101 in trading, investment in life. Don't put all of your eggs in one basket. And when we're talking about systemizing and diversifying, or when we're talking about day trading, systemizing, it keeps us objective. We'll talk a little bit about that. When we're talking about diversifying, let's say that you have a bunch of money, let's say $100,000. It's not about putting $100,000 in one thing. $100,000 allows you to diversify and to put you know, chunks of 20000 or 10000 a few different things to try to reduce that systemic risk of you losing everything. And the preservation of capital is the number one rule when you're trying to get to that end game because if you lose your money, you're starting from zero. You should always be taking step-by-step, -step, little steps forward. Sometimes we take steps backwards, but as long as you're moving forward overall, then you're going to hit that end game at some point. Okay, so that's really what today's presentation is about. And that's going to kind of kick things off into our first official slide, which is my first house. Now, I know what you're thinking. A lot of people see this first house and they're like, what the hell is that? That is not what I was expecting. When somebody was talking about their trading journey and somebody was going to talk about how they're successful, I thought I'd be looking at some sort of mansion on the water on Lake Huron or something. But this is my first house. And I'm very proud of this first house. And I still own that house today. Now, a lot of people are expecting slides like this. When you're talking about success and you're talking about trading and you're talking about these really sexy topics, where's the Rolex? Where's the, the guy with the champagne on the, on the, um, uh, sitting on the beach, kind of, kind of hitting his keyboard with one hand, making it look so easy. Guy jumping on the bed because he just hit a 16 profitable trades in a row. That's marketing, right? So the beginning of the journey, marketing. Now we're actually going to talk about how, what it is that kicked everything off, right? So. I guess we can talk about this house specifically, but this wasn't a, as a result of seriously investing my money. This wasn't a result of cryptocurrency. This house was a result of some serious sweat equity. Long story short, I was living in Toronto. I was working really, really, really hard. I was working four jobs at one point. Um, at one point, I was working at Invesco, which is as a client relationship representative, just some sort of fun company. And phone, the phones ring every day and you pick up the phone and you answer the advisor questions, really basic stuff. Uh, I think it was paying about 20 bucks an hour, about $40,000 a year. At night, I was a personal trainer at Good Life Fitness. Uh, so across the street from Invesco, there was a gym. I tried to pick up some extra money. So I was a personal trainer there for a bit. Over the weekends, I would do reporting from a first company I worked for in Toronto, uh, which the company's name is Analytics Smart. And I would just do some reporting that kind of uh, inherited from when I left that first job. And he still needed some help to obviously do some reporting. So I was doing that. And then the fourth job would have been trading. And trading at this point, you need money to make money. And at the time, I didn't have a whole lot of money. So yes, I was a profitable trader at the time, but I didn't have a whole lot of money. So just kind of keep that in mind. Now, this whole thing kind of happened because I'm living in Toronto, yet this house, if you look it up, it's located in Sudbury. Sudbury is about four hours north of Toronto. And I'm not like, it's not like I'm traveling back and forth from Sudbury to Toronto to go to work here. So I'm living in Toronto. I'm probably paying about $1,600 a month in rent. And I'm trying to get into the real estate market. And it's even worse today than it was you know, three, four years ago. However, at the time, I had managed to save up probably about 5% of this down deposit. So this purchase price was about $275,000 at the time for this house. And... I could have bought the house and then rented it out. But again, that's too much hassle and um, never really been a landlord before. And one thing led to another and I'm always open to opportunities. And my brother was paying $1,800 a month just for a garage. So he was a mechanic and he's also paying $1,200 a month for his apartment. So he's paying $3,000 a month just in rent and he doesn't own any of the spots. And that was at the time, right? So we got talking and obviously one thing leads to another. And I kind of had the idea to say, well, I want to buy some real estate and I definitely can't afford anything in Toronto. 
but I can absolutely afford something in Sudbury. So I asked them and I said, why don't you go around Sudbury, go meet with a couple of realtors, go see if you can find a house that's going to meet your purpose. So it's, it's got to have a garage. It's got to have some storage room for the cars and the boats and everything else that you repair. It's got to have obviously some square footage and potentially we can rent out the basement, kind of make a little bit of rental money that way. And uh, one thing led to another. My mom ended up renting the basement. My brother was living upstairs. He had his mechanical business outside. And the whole thing was basically $1,800 a month for the mortgage. Now, $1,800 a month is obviously a lot better than the $3,000 he was paying before. And now he didn't have some sort of annoying landlord overseeing everything that he was doing. And I was confident and trust that he'd take care of the whole place. And it was just a really win-win scenario. Now, the key thing here that we're going to use throughout this entire thing. So I'm spending a little bit more time on this one because... It's important that you understand the thought process behind this. One, it solved the problem. I wanted to get into the real estate world, but I couldn't afford Toronto. It got me into Sudbury. Two, I didn't have to hire a property management company or anything like that because I had family that's going to be staying in the house. While I'm not making any rental money on a monthly basis because my family's staying in there and the costs pretty much are equal to the income, I am exposed to the capital appreciation of the house. So today's value is about 400,000 and I bought it for 275 back in 2017. So in roughly around four years, you're making about $125,000 in capital gain. Now that is a great investment from my perspective. Now at the time, you remember how I was saying that I was working as a personal trainer? Well, as a personal trainer, I came across one of my prospects who was an ex-trader. Um, so his name was actually Giuseppe Basile. And Giuseppe, when I first met him, barely spoke English, very thick accent. Uh, he came in, he signed up for one of those cue cards when you sign up with Good Life Fitness, and it says, yes, I'd like a free session with a personal trainer. Luck may have it. I was the one that selected or got that lead. I met him just like normal. I said, hey, how are you? Do a little bit of history. Do a 30-minute uh, demonstration session. Uh, he loved the session. And as a personal trainer, it's really important to note that it, it sales, right? At the end of the day, yes, you need qualifications and you need to, uh, you actually need to know what you're doing. However, a big part of that job is sales. So they teach you a good life that you should always start with the big premium package because everybody could use a premium package, right? And then once the people say no, or if they say no, then you go on to smaller packages until they're basically comfortable with it. Whether that goes from one year down to six months, down to two months, down to two weeks, right? So this person, we go through the entire session and um, I essentially say, okay, well, this is fantastic. You know, based on um, what you told me you're available for, I think we should book you in four times a week. And I think that if we put you on a yearly plan, what's going to happen is these are the results that you're going to get. You're going to lose, you know, X amount of pounds. You're going to feel tremendous. Your energy levels are going to be up and so on and so forth. I think the package is worth something like $12,000. And he did not even blink at the time, right? So I said, I can, I suggested this package he says okay yeah that, that that's a good idea with his italian accent and i was like so you want to sign up for the one year package and he says yeah for sure and i was like wow i have no idea i've never sold an entire year's worth of package to anybody i think the biggest one besides that was maybe two months so i was impressed obviously needless to say turns out this guy works in algorithms at a casino and he's he's obviously a really he's a wizard uh for for lack of a better word and um, so we start training together and one thing leads to another and we become friends and turns out that he was about to launch his first trading course. And so he asked me one day and he said, Hey, uh, Ben, uh, would you be uh, interested in, in a trading course? And I was like, well, yeah, you know, it depends on how much, like how much does your course sell for? And he's like, well, about $5,000. And I was like, well, no, I'm, I'm working four jobs to try to save money to be able to buy different things. I'm not going to pay $5,000 for something I'm not really that passionate about. And he's like, no, no, no. And he's laughing. And he says, it's going to be for free for you. Uh, we're friends. You know, you've helped me a lot with this personal training stuff. I've lost a ton of weight. I feel so great. He's like, hey, you'd actually be doing me a favor because you can let me know and give me some feedback on the course after you take it, especially since you don't have a trading background. So that's pretty much where this started. So what ended up happening is I attended the course. I had no idea what he was talking about, like at all. I studied finance and I had no idea what he was talking about. When you go to school for finance, they teach you that fundamental investing is the best way. Uh, they, they emphasize things like past performance is not indicative of future performance. Like they just brainwash you to say that day trading is not good. You should be buying and holding for the long term. And that's it. So when I took his course, I had no idea what it was. Number one, I was familiar with equities and stocks, but he talked about Forex. He talked about pips. He talked about Fibonacci retracements, all of these things that I had no clue. 
And um, so he asked me for feedback the next day. And I said, honestly, Joseph, I have no idea what that course was. It was two hours and it was a bit of a waste of time for me because I've, I, it's way beyond me. Like it's out of my depth. And he's like, yeah, true. Well, this course is actually for people that have been trading for a while that haven't been able to kind of nail it. And uh, it takes it kind of to the next level. So he's like, what you need is some sort of foundation first. So I said, well, well where do I get one of those? And he said, well, there's a lot of free courses online that you can take. Uh, you can go to babypips.com. You can learn the basics of Forex. And that should really give you a really good understanding of the basics. So I said, okay, well, that, that sounds great. Let, let me go ahead and do that. So that's where it started. So I started taking these basic courses. Uh, and then it got me familiar with, with trading. And I, I started to fall in love with it. I started to do a lot of YouTubing, a lot of reading. I read all the books that he recommended. Dr. John Van Tarp, Joe DiNapoli, uh, David Halsley. A lot of these famous traders that teach and basically profess trading and i loved it so it didn't take more than a few weeks for me to actually resign at good life fitness and i had to tell joseph joseph and we're friends at the time so it wasn't that hard to tell him to say that i'm going to be passing you off to clay another trainer and he says well why i was like well because i'm going to put the time that instead of personal training people i'm going to put that time towards learning about trading and taking your course and doing it all seriously so it was kind of a, a, a funny concept i guess so this would have been back in October. Uh, and within three months, I was uh, a profitable trader, which by any standard, if anybody's familiar with trading, it that's that's a very, very, very short time frame. And most people, it's not believable. However, I do have a presentation here that you can still find online from 2014. And uh, right, you can't, you can't fake that. So go ahead and do a search for how to start trading like a professional, Benjamin Charbonneau, and you'll see that this presentation still exists. Now, Long story short on this one, uh, Joseph belonged to an organization that was called FX Street, still around today. Now, FX Street is essentially a company that creates events for traders all over the world. In this specific case, they were hosting an event in downtown Toronto at the Sheridan Hotel. And they had a really famous trader come in and they were supposed to speak. However, about three days before the event, he bailed didn't show up, something was going to happen. I didn't find out the details, but they knew that they were not going to have this famous trader speak. So they're trying to deliberate and trying to find out what they're going to do. And so they go to Joseph and they say, Joseph, do you know anybody who could speak potentially? And he's like, well, no, I don't really know anybody here. But then he got thinking and he said, well, I do have a student that just kind of started and he's getting, getting ridiculously impressive results. And they got interested and said, really? They're like, yeah, so maybe we can tweak the presentation change it to something like how to start trading like a professional, but from like a beginner's perspective. And uh, so the committee accepted it. And then he, he told me, well, he told me, but I was not excited. Naturally, um, I, I said no at first. He asked me, Ben, I, uh, I have a question for you. Would you mind speaking at the Sheraton Hotel to, to give a presentation to other traders? I said, well, absolutely not. I'm a beginner. Well, I'm not going to be speaking to people who have been trading for years on how to trade. And I literally just started. That's ridiculous. And he said, no, no. So he explained the situation a little bit. And then he kind of, kind of guilt tripped me a little bit. And he says, well, you'd really be doing me a favor. And, uh, what are you supposed to tell to the guy who just taught you how to trade, how to basically a new life skill? And he didn't even charge you for it. And he took a bunch of extra time to mentor you to explain some of the concepts that you didn't understand. Well, I was kind of screwed, right? I had no choice but to say yes to this. And I'm happy I did naturally. So this is kind of what happened. So you can see that, that the first shot is CMC Markets. Now, CMC Markets is a broker in Canada, and they were also the ones sponsoring the event. Now, when I say sponsoring the event, I said that we were doing the event at the Sheridan Center. Well, you got to pay for that hotel, right? So FX Street is pretty much a non-for-profit. And so somebody has got to pay for that hotel room. And that hotel seminar room was paid for by CMC Markets. And their, I guess you can say, why would they do that? Well, because their job is to get as many clients as possible trading on their trading platform. And the more clients that trade on their trading platform, the more commissions are paid and so on and so forth, and the more money they make, right? So that's their job. So they're looking for clients. And what better way to find clients than to sponsor an event where it's going to be held in the downtown Toronto and have over a hundred different traders present who are trading on different brokers. And that's basically how that happened. So I gave the presentation. I'm not going to go into detail on the presentation, but it went, it went fairly well. And uh, at the end of everything, we're at the bar, we're having social drinks and the, uh, the head of the office and CMC and, and some of the other supervisors came to me and said, you know, that was a really great presentation. Thank you so much. And um, through conversation, they had asked if, uh, if I'd ever be interested in a job in sales. 
And uh, I said, oh, that's, that's interesting. Um, I mean, I'm kind of trading full time right now for myself. I'm finally at the point now where I can kind of trade, but never really thought about working for a broker. So it piqued my interest. And then they said, well, you know, it'd be even better if you spoke French. And I laughed and I said, well, French is actually my first language. So that works out well. And then they immediately said, okay, we, you know, we want you to start. That would be fantastic. I think it'd be really advantageous and give you a lot of exposure to the other side of the world. Right. And uh, so I agreed. So I ended up going to work for CMC Markets. And through that process, it was like, we talked about learning curve before. Imagine a learning curve for somebody who was just working in mutual funds to be exposed to futures, options, interest rate, um, you know, dividends, any, any fancy term in the world of finance that you can imagine. And then, but not just being exposed to that, but having to pass exam upon exam upon exam um, in order to be qualified to speak to different representatives or to different clients, at least. So CMC markets, in order to work for them in Canada, at least, you need to have your security, Canadian securities course at a minimum. Then you need to go get your derivatives fundamental course and your futures licensing course and your conducts and practices handbook course, which is pretty much epics, just to be able to speak to clients. And you're not even giving them advice, but you need all these designations because contracts for difference which is like Forex and what a lot of brokers do. Uh, we won't, won't get into CFDs right now, but to be able to talk to them, you need to be qualified at a minimum level. So starting to educate myself uh, at a more formal level, right? So you go from looking YouTube, looking at books to actually taking formal courses. And I loved it so much that I kept going. So I kept going. I took the additional investment management techniques course. I took the portfolio management techniques course. That ended up giving me the Chartered Investment Management designation, um, which is a big deal in Canada. It essentially allows you to be a portfolio manager, right? So, But you'll notice on this screen that it, it says here, uh, not in good standing, right? So why would, um, why would somebody go through all of this trouble, do all of these courses, just to end up with a not in good standing beside a designation? So in order for you to put CIM beside my name, I would have to be in good standing, but I'm not in good standing. So why would I let that expire? And it's really easy to explain once you see the rack of books here. So on the left shelf down here, this you can say that that's level one, this is level two, and this is level three. This course is called the Chartered Financial Analyst designation. It's essentially usually a three-year program, and it is grueling. The amount of content that you need to learn for each exam is just immense. Uh, each exam has quantitative methods, economics, financial reporting and analysis, corporate finance, equity investments, fixed income, derivatives, alternative investments, and portfolio management. Now, it's important to note that these exams are each one of them are six hours in length, three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon, and that the level two and the level three exams are only offered once per year. So people, I know a friend of mine who's been going on this for eight years now. And it, they're finally at the last level. And they're just trying to pass it. And they're actually going to write it in a few days from now. So I really hope that they end up passing it. But it is intense how difficult this is. Because if you do fail it, it's not like you can just sign up, brush up on the things you didn't know, and try it again the week after. You have to wait an entire year to be able to do it again. So naturally, by the time the next year comes around, you can't just write it again without studying because you'd forget most of the stuff that you were learning, right? So very, very difficult exam. I encourage you to look it up online if you have more questions about the Chartered Financial Analyst designation. It's an incredible experience and very humbling experience, to say the least. Uh, my time was basically working, studying, working and studying. That's actually pretty much it. But the advantage by doing that is that I was able to save a lot of money. I was still able to trade. I was still able to save a lot of money and I didn't spend unnecessarily, right? So in December 2016, I sat for level one, and then I went right into June 2017 to write level two, so about six months later, and then I was lucky to pass that. And then one year later, when level three was offered, I did that from Australia, and I'll get into that after, and I was able to pass that. So I was really, really, really lucky to go straight through one shot, one shot, one shot. A uh, very, very rare thing to do when it comes to this program. Uh, so it took me a year and a half to finish it. And again, very, very difficult thing to do, but I was very happy. And uh, what that kind of shows, and it's not to, to brag or anything like that, but it just goes to show you how passionate I was about this space. And I guess I am today still, right? Finance, investment, portfolio management, trading. It's something you either like or you don't like. It's really difficult to pass this program if you don't like the space. 
And um, that just kind of shows a testament to that. So you could look up the directory online. You type in Benjamin Charbonneau, you're going to see my name. I'm still in active status. So this is why I don't hold the uh, Chartered Investment Management designation because I have the CFA. And the CFA to me is about 100 times more um, important or significant than the CIM designation. So that's a little bit of background on terms of the education, the designation aspect of it. Um, so to say that it's not just some random person coming off the street, I am someone that holds a Chartered Financial Analyst designation and I am quite active in that space. And it is something that I am passionate about. So all of that leads us to our first diversified investment. Now, whenever I talk about this or a Toronto penthouse, so well, number one, I don't generally talk about the Toronto penthouse because the first thing that people think about is that you're a millionaire, right? Whenever you say to someone that you own a Toronto penthouse, they immediately think that you're a millionaire. However, this is the story behind that. Remember, I've been, I've been studying at this point for uh, a year and a half. Well, a year, I guess at this point, um, I'm grinding, I'm working, I'm learning a lot. I'm, I'm just really in that learning phase. I'm still making some money, right? I'm not spending it because I'm spending all my time studying. So I'm able to kind of save a little bit of money on the side at the same time that I'm working, studying. And then I come across this opportunity while I'm in Toronto. And I believe it came through a condo.com email or condo now email. And it was a marketing email just to say that there are pre-construction opportunities in Toronto. So I thought to myself, pre-construction, that's, that sounds fantastic. What, how does that work? So got into it a little bit. And, and normally when you invest in a pre-construction condo, it means that you're basically putting a deposit in now and the condo will be built usually about three years later. Okay. So you, you put a deposit in now and your condo will be ready three years later. Now, most of the time you need much more than 5%. You need 5% to basically lock in that you're going to keep the condo within 30 days. You need to put up another 5% of the total purchase price within 180 days, usually another 5% and within a year, another 5%. So they allow you to tier it five, five, five and five. But at the end of the day, you're still putting 20% down. Well, the purchase price of this Toronto penthouse is about 600,000 at the time. I didn't have 20% of 600,000 to put down. That's over a hundred grand. Nope, not going to happen. Not, uh, not at least at that point in my life. So I didn't have it. But what I did have, and I was really fortunate is I had invested in crypto, but I did not capitalize on when Bitcoin almost hit 20,000 the first time. In fact, I didn't even invest in Bitcoin. I invested in a token called C20. C20 stands for Crypto20. And it's basically an ETF, and it's still around today, that tracks the top 20 cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin's number one, Ethereum's number two, right? And then so on and so forth, if you're familiar with crypto. And it basically invests and diversifies within the top 20, and it does a weekly rebalance. Anyway, I had put in roughly $20,000 into that, and then that had climbed all the way up to 80,000. But again, being fairly new at that space, I didn't cash in at 80,000 and anybody who says that they can capture the entire move are either really lucky or they're lying, probably lying. So I did not catch at 80,000. I didn't even catch 60,000. Um, when it came down about halfway point, I cashed in at 40,000, feeling a little sheepish, feeling a little bit, you know, down on myself because I missed out on another 40,000 of growth. But you get used to that and you kind of learn to appreciate the whole not being greedy aspect. Anyway, long story short, I ended up getting this, um, this deposit of 5% on 600,000 because the developer had a special promotion that said 5% all in. That's it. So with 5%, you can lock in your condo. And then in three years, when it's built, you'll be able to have it for 5% and then get a mortgage on the property and, and keep going from that front. So I thought to myself, this is an incredible opportunity. I did not have to buy the penthouse, but I thought, I'm never going to live in this place. I'm never going to live in a penthouse. I'm not going to do anything like that. If I can put away about $30,000 and each year, generally speaking, the condo market appreciates around five, five to 10%. It really depends on if it's Toronto or Vancouver or Montreal, but the market in Toronto has been just hot, right? So I thought if I'm going to spend 600,000, but I'm only going to need 5% to do that. So 30,000. And then in the, year, the year after, property markets continue to increase in value. Let's say that the property market appreciated by 5% the following year. Technically, I, I wouldn't have realized those gains, but technically my condo would be worth an extra 30,000, right? So 5% on 600. So let's say 630,000. The following year, what if it grows by another 5% and then so on and so forth. So in my mind, it was like locking $30,000 and in three years, I'll be able to make at least, say, $90,000 in terms of a, a profit, right? So that was my uh, my thought process at the time. 
Now, of course, you can't foresee the future, but the markets have gone a lot higher than 5%. So in today's date, it's been delayed. Um, and I'm quite happy if that condo gets delayed another three years. So because of COVID, naturally, it's not going to be ready December 2021. It'll be ready December 2022. And if we're honest, probably maybe 2023 sometime. But again, very happy about that because every year that it gets delayed, the condo market as a whole appreciates. And that means when I'm finally going to take possession of my condo, my 600000 purchase price condo will now be worth it's probably close to 950000 if not more. If you do a search online right now in the Lawrence and Keele Toronto area, you'll see three bedroom, three bathroom condos usually selling for about $1.1 to over $1 million dollars. In, uh, in value. So again, this is not an example of someone who got really lucky, who put money in, hit it big on a lottery. This was very careful planning and logical. What are the odds that the condo is worth less than 600,000 in three years time? That was the big question. If I lock in a purchase price right now of 600, is it gonna be worth less than that three years from now? And the probabilities based on the research that I had done at the time were no. It will not be worth, even if it's the same price, that's fine. But I don't believe it's going to be worth less than 600000 And sure enough, it's obviously worth a lot more. So this was one of the first major decisions, I guess you can say, in terms of an investment. So we had that house in Sudbury. That's pretty much taken care of itself with the family living there. I came across this deal. And these deals are not once in a lifetime deals. They happen all the time. But this is a matter of subscribing to the various groups, the free subscription channels, and um, kind of getting, you know, the mag the real estate magazines, if you're gonna be in the Toronto, the Vancouver, the Montreal area, being kind of tapped in because this is not a private sale and only a few people had access to this. They had hundreds of units available, right? So it's just a matter of being open to the opportunity, thinking about it, and then making a decision and going from there. So I had investments in cryptocurrencies. I was actively day trading. I had a capital, but I reinvested into something more tangible that potentially had an option of growing a lot more, right? Without, with a lot less effort to just park money there and then wait is a lot easier than actively trading, right? So these are the kind of decisions that I decided to make. So that was the Toronto penthouse. And, um, what was it? Yeah. That, well, there's a picture of my dog because that's essentially all my life was about studying working and the dog and anybody who has a dog will understand, but that's pretty much it. So moving on from there, we've got these waterfront properties and uh, I'm going to be a hundred percent honest with you. I had to change this presentation because this is how fast things have changed. So the property value that I had in my slides um, about three days ago was about 200. Yeah. Give or take about 200,000. And, um, realistically, what ended up happening is that my mom, out of all people, um, if you knew me, that's not the person that I would imagine that would have actually told me about this uh, in piece of information. So she mentioned that she read an article in the paper that said, you know, waterfront properties in the Sudbury and the Manitoulin area, pretty much anything northern Ontario, have moved up by 300% in the last two years. So I said, there's, there's no way. So what actually happens that that's in today, right? So this is two years from now is, is today, but two years ago, I was first given the option of investing in these properties. And these properties came up in all types of, of plots, no electricity, no service, not tied up to municipal uh, sewage. So it's really an off the grid property located on Manitoulin Island. So you can look up Manitoulin Island in your own time, but they were uh, these little plots that you see, and uh, they're worth about 50,000 a piece. At the time, I did not have any money because as you just saw, I invested my money on this penthouse. So I put the money that I needed, about 30000 and that's pretty much it. I didn't have much more money than that. So when it came down to an opportunity to invest in Rotterdam for properties at around 50000 a piece, I didn't have any money to do this. However, I was making decent money, I guess you can say, with CMC, uh, you know, 40000 50000 a year. Nothing crazy, especially after paying rent in Toronto. But I was also trading. Now, my trading income at the time, the trading capital is probably about fifteen or twenty thousand. I was probably generating about oh, maybe two to four hundred dollars a week in income doing that. So nothing crazy, right? You're not going to retire on that. But it was it was definitely some extra income that after I paid my bills, it allowed me to save a little bit more money. But the important thing was the cash flow. So making about three to four hundred dollars a week definitely help offset my monthly payment. So this is what I did. So whenever people think about somebody getting to their end game and stuff like that, it, it is not a non-risk way of going about it. 
what I did, and I'm not super proud of this, but I wouldn't do it. I would do it again if I had the choice. If anything, I'd buy more property. I had a line of credit around 40,000 was my limit. And these three properties together, I got a deal. So one of them I bought for, uh, they wanted 50,000 for each one. But I said, well, if I buy more than one, I want a discount. They agreed. So one of them I bought, I think for 39,000, the other one I bought for 46,000 and the other one for 42,000 or something like that. So average price across the board of about 136,000. And that gave me access to the three properties. However, I did not have 136,000. I didn't even have 10,000 to be able to put together for this. So not of available capital anyway. So I ended up getting a loan from Case Populaire or Desjardins, if you're unfamiliar with Case Populaire. And they gave me a financing loan of 4.95%, but I had to put a deposit down of about 20%. Well, I didn't have that 20%. So what I ended up doing is I took the 20% from my line of credit. So it's basically like leverage on leverage. So I borrowed 20% from my line of credit. I gave that as a deposit on these properties. And the balance was paid for by this 10-year fixed loan from Desjardins, which as you can see at the bottom left here, was about a thousand bucks a month. A thousand bucks a month is a pretty heavy payment. and uh, But I was okay with that because I was making... That side income from the trading was enough to offset that. So I was still working a regular job, paying my expenses, saving money. But the money that I was making from trading was enough to offset this payment. Now, my plan at that time was, you know what, maybe three to five years down the road, maybe I'll build a cottage, maybe I'll build a prefabricated home on these properties. I don't know, but I, I like having the option of being able to build something. And they're beautiful waterfront properties. In fact, you can take a, um, I'll take you to the actual post that I just recently put on. So this was only a few days ago, and that's why I had to redo this presentation. So this post I put up, it's uh, literally a very lengthy post advertising three lots. And each one of them are advertised for 124000 uh, which again, if you bought it for an average purchase price of 42000 selling it for 124000 less than two years later is a massive return. So I could hold on to them in the hopes, but I'm going to take advantage of COVID and because this is the reason that these properties are moving higher and higher. People working from home now, people are able to um, not ever have to go to the city. So they're branching away from the city and going to these beautiful northern areas in order to build their dream house. So all of the waterfront properties are being soaked up and eaten alive. And so if you've got some waterfront properties that are available for sale, you can really make a nice penny, which is what I'm doing now. So this is updated as of two days ago. I just decided to make a very clear post and literally within the first day, one of the properties sold and uh, the other property sold as well. However, the person could come up with financing, but there are 30 people interested in these properties. So what we're doing now is essentially advertising it and saying that I'll take offers until Sunday at 4 p.m. So another four or five days from now. And the point is that there's going to be a bidding war for the final two properties. So at a minimum, the sell price for the three properties will be about $372,000. This is an absolute gem of investment. But again, this is completely different. So we talked about a, a really safe, conservative home purchase in Sudbury. We talked about a Toronto penthouse that at the end of the day is quite conservative as an investment, right? Parked away around $30,000, put it away for about three to four years fairly conservative. And then we get across an opportunity to invest in waterfront properties. And again, this would have put me a little bit more stretched, right? So you're incorporating another payment of $1,000 a month. However, the trading income was enough to offset that. But I thought that as a conservative play, three to five years, this could be good, right? This could be good for my end game. This could be 10 years down the road. But at the end of the day, this can absolutely help me achieve my end game, which is living on the water, having a nice, decent house, kind of quiet. That's part of my end game personally. So this kind of fit into that overall objective, right? The point with all this is that this was just an investment opportunity. It is not, not just one investment. So we're at three investments so far of key strategic decisions of investing. In this case, this wasn't a cash deal. I borrowed money from my line of credit to be able to pay for the deposit. Okay, so this is not coming from somebody who had a lot of money. This was borrowed money. And yes, it was a risk. But obviously, the risk paid off really, really well. That's the plot plan. And we're good to move on. So at this point, we had just purchased these three lots. We had purchased that penthouse. Things are working really, really well with CMC. I had the designations now. 
um, essentially, you know, busting, busting my backhand here, working, we're working really, really hard. But again, when you're doing something that you really enjoy, it's not really that much work. So I did fairly well uh, from the corporate side of things and CMC essentially offered the opportunity for me to go work in Sydney, Australia as their head of sales for Asia Pacific. So the opportunity to me was extremely attractive. The option of going to work here, right? I mean, it, when you're thinking about this, this is, this is usually something you see in the magazine and it's compare Canada to a paradise like this. Not that Canada is not a paradise, but it's a paradise about two or three months of the year. And then you factor in the winter and you're pretty miserable. So at the end of the day, this yellow tower that you see here with the arrow, this is where CMC's new office is located in Australia. So this is Tower 3 in the district of Barangaroo in the state of New South Wales in the city of Sydney. And this was my view. So from level 20, you can see the harbor, the yachts, um, the casinos just on the other side. This is an absolute gem. And it was beautiful. And I have to say, obviously, from a trading perspective, being close to the people who were actually on the trading floor, being able to interact with people from operations, being able to talk to the CEO naturally, like there's a lot of things that from that experience that I've learned that I've incorporated in my life, obviously, from the way that I find, the way that I think, the way that I process information to the way that I work. And of course, a lot of the discipline aspects. Now, it wasn't all work naturally while I was out there. There was a lot of fun times. And um, one of the greatest experiences I've had to date um, was the ability to fight in a corporate charity fight. So this is Corporate Fighter and they have locations all over the world. But in this specific case, um, the opportunity came up to say, hey, um, we're going to sponsor someone to fight in a charity boxing match. Now, it's charity boxing because the all of the money that's raised, and you can see here, there's probably about a thousand people in this room. All of the money raised in this black tie event went, in this specific case, to Beyond Blue, which is essentially an organization that um, promotes and awareness of depression. So Beyond Blue, it's all about asking people if they're okay. It's all about promoting the fact that depression is a real illness. It's a real disease. And all the money kind of went to that cause. So naturally, and admittedly, I was, uh, I am, you know, I, it's a great organization, great charity, but I was just really pumped to be able to fight in a boxing match and train for 12 weeks to be able to do that. So uh, the full fight's available on YouTube. But again, uh, I know that if I was watching this, I would definitely want to see a clip. So I will show you a clip. Nice uh, from Henny Charbonneau with a gallop and a good right. Coming at the fighters now, Henny. Oh, good swinging arm there. Oh, down goes Henny. Down goes Henny. Charbonneau. The combination, it wasn't pretty, but it was effective. That's it. That is it. Henny is down and out. He's back on two feet, which is good to see. You can see the coaching staff come in. But Benny Charbonneau... He's been too good here in this one. About number four of. Okay, so that's a little bit of a sneak peek. Obviously, I have nothing to do with trading investments, but definitely part of the end game. It's not always about just the end game, but the journey to how you get there is also really important, right? So, in this specific context, amazing opportunity. We had such a good time, and it was a really, really, really humbling experience, I guess you can say, to get in the ring. A thousand people looking at you, including. Probably about uh, 25 of your coworkers that are there uh, watching you, obviously cheering you on and hoping that you do well. So that was a really fun experience when I was out in Australia. And um, yeah, just wanted to kind of run that by you guys. But unfortunately, not as good of an experience was shortly after. So that was in 2019, that fight. And then in 2020, around January 2020, COVID started taking place. And we all know how that is currently going. And we're still seeing the effects of that all over the world. Now, ironically, um, New Zealand and Australia are some of the two countries that have almost zero cases. So it would have been very, very good for me to stay there. However, had I done that, I might have never been able to uh, see the family for a long time. So COVID-19 kicks. And obviously, we have to kind of roll with the punches and adapt just like everyone else. Now, you might be familiar with the stock market in general. Uh, and again, if you're not familiar with the stock market in general, this is a chart of the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is just 500 different companies in America. That's it. So whenever people talk about, oh, a stock market crash or an economy or anything like that, they're usually talking about the major index of that country. In this case, you'll usually hear the Dow Jones or the S&P 500. So this is the S&P 500. And you can see 
that from February 2020 to April 2020, so pretty much just about two months, just shy of three, the market tanked about 35% due to COVID. Now, is it due to COVID or is it mainly the fear of COVID? So usually this stuff is driven by fear and the worry that all the businesses are going to shut down, everything's going to be bad. It's definitely an overreaction, right? So it was a lot more tapered than this, but the immediate reaction was pandemic, 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 sell, 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 and then you get a 36% correction in the market. What a lot of people don't know. So a lot of people are familiar with the stock market crashing, but what a lot of people don't know is that even today, the stock market is so much stronger than it was before COVID. And a lot of people have no idea how that's possible. So I'm not going to give you the exact answer right now, but I will show you a chart of Amazon during that same time period. So this is the U.S. stock market. Now take a look at chart of Amazon. So here's Amazon during that same period. And notice from February 2020 to April 2020, notice how small that correction is compared to a lot of different ones, compared to the one that we just saw, right? Huge correction, tiny correction. Interesting. So now I want you to think about it starts to kind of make sense when you think about it, but you're thinking COVID, you're thinking stay at home, you're thinking restrictions, you're saying lockdowns, measures, etc. Well, people got to eat, right? So grocery stores, grocery chains, anything qualified as essential stayed open. And now people are at home. What are they going to do at home? Well, they're definitely going to watch some Netflix. They're definitely going to watch some Amazon Prime. People are getting stimulus checks, especially in America and the UK and Canada. They're getting COVID assistance. So if you did lose your job because of COVID, you're getting, in a lot of cases, you're getting just as much money from the COVID uh, relief program or the stimulus program than you were when you were working, right? So if you're making less than 20 bucks an hour, you're pretty much the same as when you were working, except now you have all the time in the world to kind of do whatever you want to do. You can't go to restaurants. You can't go do these different things, but you can definitely shop online on Amazon. So from the moment that the uh, price dipped after the correction in April, Amazon rallied 110% and it had never corrected as much as it did in, in the actual stock market. So this is something to kind of keep in mind. With this kind of return comes immense amounts of opportunities. So at the time, I haven't gone back to Canada yet. I'm in Australia. I'm working for a broker. I'm managing different offices, whether it's Singapore, New Zealand, Canada, uh, Australia, Hong Kong, China, in not managing the entire offices, but definitely the sales operations from that side or their strategic, um, their vision, their, the strategy behind it and so on and so forth. And the amount of interest that was coming through was phenomenal. Part of my job was obviously listening to phone calls from sales agents. So that could be picking up the phone from people who are asking questions about our trading platform, our products and um, services and anything like that. And you could not imagine how many people were looking for help looking for education, looking to know what to buy, looking for what to sell. And as somebody who's managing the sales operations, you want to be able to give your reps some resources, right? You want to be able to say, okay, well, if somebody's going to ask you for trading resources or education, you can direct them to our website here, or you can direct them to this website there, or Investopedia here, or anything like that. And one thing that I found when I was going through the research on this is that there's not a whole lot out there. Like, surprisingly, you'll see a lot of information on Facebook ads and stuff like that. People, especially when you start looking at trading stuff, they're going to target you. They're going to say, okay, take this course or take that. And, you know, it's usually a, a ridiculously expensive course for the information that's kind of subpar. However, the one thing that was really, really unique in this space is that there was nothing that was transparent, nothing that was professional and nothing that was credible. So people that were doing these signals, people that were doing the education, in most cases, did not back up their credentials. They didn't say that they had some sort of, not that you absolutely need credentials to be successful. However, if you're going to give a course on it, at least have worked in the industry, at least have a proven track record of success, um, at least have somebody else backing you that is famous trader or something like that. But a lot of these courses didn't have that. They just flashed charts of profits and said, Hey, I made $3,000 in five minutes, sign up to this course or do this. And it's not something that I was able to share with clients. Of course, if you're going to be working for a public company like that, if you do make recommendations for courses, it has to go through compliance. It has to get credible. It has to get backed. Right? So I wasn't able to pretty much give any of these courses and, and things and resources that I wanted to give because they weren't authentic courses. So what do you do? Well, as the demand flooded CMC, 
new clients are coming through, new demands are coming through. We're barely able to keep up with the demand for opening accounts. These are people opening accounts and oftentimes they have basic information. Let's say the basic amount of knowledge to be able to open an account, right? Never really traded before, but maybe they had a portfolio, maybe somebody managed it for them, but the interest is there and the desire to learn is there, but not there's no premium content um, or signal generation service that was actually authentic that you could help them with. So through my research, I came across Trade Doctors and it was a relatively new company, but their marketing was horrible and they did not actively market anywhere else. They really focused on the French Canadian side of things. They had a lot of France clients. They had a little bit of Spanish clients, but these guys here were putting, uh, this is a classic example of traders doing trading stuff and people with that experience. And it's ironic because some people say that they're, you know, they're just brilliant marketers in the world of trading education. But the reason that I couldn't find these guys for a long time is because their online presence, minimal, their advertising, zero. They never advertised on Facebook. They never advertised on, um, on, fa on uh, YouTube. They never did anything like that. So coming across this report that I saw, it was essentially a summary report. And that, that's kind of what hooked me. I thought, my God, this is, um, this is ridiculous. This is fantastic. Here's this company providing transparent signals on a daily basis across equities, across Forex, across commodities, across futures. And not only are they giving signals, they're giving take profit levels, they're giving stop loss levels, and then they're going a step further and they're giving a quarterly summary of their outcome. Did they make money or did they lose money? And then they're backing it with a telegram group that is verifiable, which means you can check every single trade that they've ever done dating back to the first signal that they've ever sent. And you can coordinate that with the performance report. And of course, you can look it up on a chart and you'll see that, yeah, authentically and genuinely, they have been profitable for the last 18 months, which is how long they've been doing signals for. And it's verifiable, which I thought was mind blowing. And then when I reached out to them and started talking about different opportunities and stuff like that, they offered, of course, that I come on board and basically help them reshape their education structure, their signals, their algorithms. Uh, I had a lot of experience with doing presentations on MT4 at the time and cryptocurrencies and a lot of the different things that I actually had to teach my reps, right? So as a head of sales, your part of your job is to, um, well, especially on the management side of things, you, you teach people who are new to the trading world. So maybe somebody has a lot of sales experience, but they might be new to the trading world. Well, that means you have to teach them foundations, right? You got to get them educated quickly. You got to teach them about Forex, commodities, indices. And not only that, you have to teach them on the back end. How are things operationally? How are things done? And it gives you a wealth of knowledge. So doing that repeatedly for years, obviously made me a pretty good candidate to put together courses. Hence comes the opportunity to work with trade doctors, almost like a consultant. And so what I did was I, I tried to find a new way of putting content together. And this is probably one of the first presentations that I'll ever do that uh, doesn't have my little avatar here. So this avatar is, um, is pretty much, I haven't seen anything in our space do it this way, but it's been proven that using a character animator or something like that reinforces um, not machine learning, but adaptive learning. So it allows you to kind of focus in. It's almost like having a teacher in school, but the fact that it's animated hits something in your brain that actually makes you more responsive to what he's saying because it's different. Now, when you're seeing a teacher speak or human speak, it's just something that we've been trained to almost ignore. We've we've seen this all the time, right? It's, it's part of our schooling, upbringing, your parents. But then as soon as you start adding a character to it, a little bit of an animation, it's completely different. It makes you far more inclined to to focus in and to listen. So that's what this was about. So I'll just give you a quick snippet on um, the active trading result that a person can realize. And then I'll show you proof of how this is done. So this is part of the foundations course. So this is one of the first courses that we've ever done. Uh, we don't sell the foundations course. We give it away for free, part of the essentials package. But at the end of the day, this foundations course is, it gives you a little bit of an example on the format. So at the time, I think my voice is a little bit docked, but it, it is a really good way of seeing what kind of a format that the trade doctors offer when they teach their premium courses. And also this specific case is about active trading. What's the difference between somebody who invests in mutual funds, the stock market, uh, hedge funds, or an active trader, and what's the difference? And then let's go through an actual example and go through that from there. So here it is. This pretty table behind me shows you the monthly return for different amounts of capital. Starting with $1,000 at the top and working all the way up to $1 million at the bottom. 
The columns show the months and how the portfolio grows over time based on the set interest rate for that savings vehicle. A mutual fund is one of the most popular North American vehicles that exists today. If you live in Canada or the US, it's almost a guarantee that you or someone you know has their money invested in a mutual fund, especially if you own an RSP, 401k, or a TFSA. Let's say I purchase a mutual fund through Bank of America. Every month, I put away $500 toward my retirement account, and this $500 purchases units of this mutual fund. Now, the mutual fund is a large pool of money that's managed by a portfolio manager and his team, who are paid very well, by the way. Their job is to take that large pot of money and invest it in different products. Stocks, bonds, maybe hold some of it in cash. Those fund managers are constantly making tweaks to the fund in order to try and get you the highest return possible. The thing isn't free. Mutual funds as well as managed funds charge a management fee as well as an administrative fee that quickly eats away at your profits because it's charged regardless if the fund did well or did bad. Over the five years, mutual funds have yielded an average annual return of 8% and the six month performance is calculated behind me for each portfolio. Just to be clear, if someone had $50,000 sitting in a mutual fund that returned 8% per year, after a six month period, they could expect their account to be worth $52,034, which is a $2,034 gain or a return just over 4% after six months. Next on the list, we take a look at hedge funds. Now hedge funds have a bit of a misleading name as it makes it sound like they specialize in hedging which is eliminating risk, but in fact, they tend to do the opposite. Hedge funds have less rules. They're generally available to sophisticated clients who have a lot of money. Since those people have a lot of money, the managers of those funds don't need to be as cautious when investing that money compared to someone who's investing in a mutual fund. So they generally have more tools available to them. For example, mutual funds are not permitted to go short or short sell assets, but hedge funds are allowed to do that because they don't have to follow the same rules. Hedge fund managers are supposed to be the best of the best. Usually the most well-paid portfolio managers will work for hedge funds. Those funds have performance bonuses and have built-in contingencies that say, hey, if we don't make money, we won't charge you a performance fee. Some hedge funds do exceptionally well, but on average, and over the past five years, They've returned an annual return of 14%, according to Investopedia. Still, those results are pretty impressive versus a mutual fund. With a $50,000 portfolio, I would have earned $3,604, or just over 7% in six months. The most interesting part of the hedge fund return is that the U.S. stock market gained on average 15% per year over the last seven years. What that means is that those who invested in the fancy hedge fund and received royalty-like treatment ended up paying so much in fees that they didn't even beat the return of the stock market. Someone could have simply purchased an S&P 500 index, you remember that product from our beginning of the course, and they would have paid nearly nothing in fees and they could have earned a better return. Keep in mind that some hedge funds returned over 60, 70, 80% per year but we're talking about on average. So on average, the average hedge fund, the average mutual fund couldn't even beat the stock market return over the last five years. So when it comes to a portfolio size, the difference between 14% and 15% on a $50,000 portfolio, it's, it's not much as you can see behind me. And now, the moment you've been waiting for, what kind of return could a successful active trader expect to earn? Now, before I show you the numbers, keep in mind that this trader is successful and part of that 10% of traders who succeed in trading. Remember that most people who attempt to trade fail and that these types of results that keep people coming back again and again. So without further ado, drum roll please. 
Voila! I'm going to stay quiet for a few seconds to give you a chance to go through the information and process it. The data behind me is actually lower than what's correct. Theoretically, a day trader is placing trades every day and he's risking 1% of his account on every trade to try and make 2% profit. As the account grows, the size of the position grows thanks to compound returns and the return at the end of the month is actually greater than 16%. But let's not get too technical. To use that same $50,000 portfolio that we talked about earlier, if a trader was able to achieve a return of 16% per month and did so every month for six months, they would have ended a portfolio of $121,820. Said another way, they would have made $70,000 in profit or achieved a return just shy of 144%. This figure absolutely dwarfs the hedge fund average return, and it's the reason thousands are trying to learn how to trade every single day. Now, keep things in mind. We're talking about a successful trader, and we're comparing this to the average hedge fund. Not a really fair comparison. If you take the best hedge fund in the world and you compare that against the best trader in the world, that might be a more fair representation, but we don't have that information. In general, if you can find your way into the top 10%, this is the type of return that is achievable. It's easy to be skeptical when presented with such figures. I'd be nervous if you didn't question these numbers. So let's take a closer look and see how this is possible. First things first, we need to go through the number of trades that were placed. Just behind me, you see 80 circles. Each circle represents one trade. An example of one trade can be found over here to the left. You can see from the difference in size between the blue and the pink rectangle that my risk is half the size of my potential profit. If I was risking $100 per trade, I would attempt to make $200 on that trade minimum. I either lose $100 or I make $200. In this case, the price went my way and I won that trade. I've kept the colors consistent to make things more clear. Blue is winning. Pink is losing. In our example, the active trader placed five trades per day and worked four days per week. Effectively, this trader placed 20 trades per week, which totals 80 trades per month which are represented by those 80 small circles over there, as we mentioned before. Now, take note that our trader isn't that good of a trader. In fact, he's wrong more often than he's right. Our trader lost 48 out of 80 trades and only won 32 out of 80 trades. In a percentage, he's only correct 40% of the time or four out of 10 times. The secret is risk management, and we cover this in detail in our next course. But in short, when our trader loses, he loses 1% of his account. When he wins, he adds 2% to his account. Notice that trade at the bottom left corner? This is exactly the type of trade this trader took 80 different times in a month on different products. Even though he was trading different products on different time frames with potentially different brokers, he always ensured that his risk to reward ratio was one for two, or 1% 1 risk for 2% reward. As you can see from the math above, he's able to net 16% profit at the end of the month and only needs to be correct, again, four out of every 10 trades. The idea of only needing to be correct four out of 10 trades with all the tools and the information available out there, it seems pretty simple. So what's the problem? Why is it that so many people fail? The problem is the emotion that comes with money and trading. 
and we'll spend a lot of time discussing behavioral finance in our next course. This is but one trading profile, and there are thousands of profiles out there. When broken down to its simplest form, trading is quite simple, but it's incredibly difficult to stay disciplined and perform well. Anyone can place a winning trade, but it takes a lot of hard work, understanding, discipline, humility, and passion to win consistently in every market environment. Okay, so that was the active trading little snippet from the foundations course. So we really went through this because, well, for one, you generally hear about active trading, but it's really difficult to understand the type of money that somebody can generate doing that. So you hear about day traders, you hear about day traders supplementing their income, you hear about day traders making a million dollars, you hear about day traders barely breaking even. Again, so to kind of see the math behind how it's possible to generate money to be able to live, right? And, and this is how it's possible. It has absolutely nothing to do with knowing the direction of the market, but it has everything to do with the probabilities of a short-term direction based on patterns that you see that tend to repeat themselves. And we're gonna go through this a little bit more into detail, but I wanna flag this screenshot. And this is something that it's it actually kind of funny because I see screenshots like this all the time. So usually, again, from marketers, and not to knock marketers, but this is really their job, right? They'll put up a post, they'll basically say, look, no losing trades, green, green, green. So in this is the MT4 platform. When you see green like this at the bottom, it means that that trade hit take profit. It's better than no color because no color means you manually close the trade and red means I hit your stop loss. Now this makes it look like the person never loses. Okay, so a lot of times this is as much as you're gonna get. People are gonna show you a screenshot. They're gonna tell you, look, I made a lot of money. Look at my screenshot. But with today's technology and everything else, it's really easy to dock these things, right? It's really easy to fabricate this content. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to show you the actual platform. In fact, this exact platform in today, not, not from three days ago, not from anything like that, but I'm going to show you the exact platform from today. So I'll just head down to my platform and here it is. So all I had done is took a screenshot of the winning trades, right? So just something like, let me scroll down here, do something like this, make it look like nothing's ever lost. And then that's it and say that I'm a really good trader. But that's not how it works, okay? There, there are absolutely losing trades, okay? Losing trades are just part of trading and it's okay. There's nothing wrong with having losing trades. If you didn't have losing trades, I'd be wondering what you're doing. And number one, it just, it does not exist. There is no professional trader in the world that does not have a losing trade. In fact, and as you saw before, most professional traders are actually incorrect more often than they're correct, okay? What that means is that if I take 10 different trades, I could be correct only four times and I can make money and I can lose six times and still make money. How is that possible? What well, has everything to do with how much are you making when you win and how much are you losing when you lose, right? These are the statistics to the actual trading game. It's incredibly important to go through them in detail. In fact, I'm going to show you this. So you know now, again, this is not a foundations course. It's not an essentials course, but I hope that at this point you understand at least the basics that, okay, well, if I, if I'm trading and I'm trying to make a hundred dollars and I'm prepared to lose $50, well, that makes sense, right? So you're risking two times. You're trying to make two times more than what you risk. So if I risk a hundred dollars, I'm trying to make 200. If I risk $500, I'm trying to make a thousand. If I'm risking $1,000, I'm trying to make $2,000, right? That's how you can get results that are profitable, even if you lose most of the time. Now, let's go take a look at the actual detailed history. So this is MT4. MT4, if you go to all history, you'll get every single trade that this account has taken. And then I'll right-click again, and I'll go down to detailed report. Because what I'm trying to see is I want to see the actual stats on this. So it's going to bring me to here, right? So here we are every transaction from the beginning. So today actually marks the one month anniversary of this account. So every trade that's been taken on this account and then the profits are on the right hand column. So anything on the right, you can see the profits on that. So they're not all profitable, right? Minus 400, minus 300, plus 500, plus 3000, plus 200, plus 600, et cetera, et cetera. 
the cool thing about MT4 is that it actually breaks this down for you into your equity curve. So it shows you, okay, is your strategy working for you? Are you growing your account? Of course, this one is. And then you can actually see at the bottom. And these are the most important figures. I'm not going to go through every single figure here, but I will mention two of them. Average loss and average win. Take a look at where it says average over here on the left. And then it says your average profitable trade, $388. And your average losing trade, negative $189.07. If you're, in case you're bad at math, each winning trade on average is two times bigger than each losing trade. Okay. And here are the second most important figures. Okay. So this is how often you're winning and how often you're losing. Or how much are you winning, sorry, on average, and how much are you losing on average? And then this is the beauty. This is the best part. Profitable trades as a total. So I took 49 trades, which represents 79 or 73.13%. So I've essentially won 49 trades and I've lost 18 trades as of a total. That means I win 73% of the time and I lose about 26.8% of the time. Okay. That's a 73% win rate. And how much did we say that we win when we win? 388. How much do we lose on average when we lose? 188. I'm only losing 27% of the time and I lose $189 when I do on average. And I'm winning 73% of the time and I'm still winning two times more than what I'm losing. This is a ridiculously profitable strategy. Okay. This is not. Uh, and most of this has actually algorithmic strategies. So it's been poor tested on our algorithms. This is now the strategies that we use in our trading signals. The results were so good that we thought, well, why bother doing manual signals if the results our algorithm are able to pick this up? They are getting equities, they're getting crypto, they're getting indices, they're getting commodities like oil and gold, and they're combining everything in an anti-correlated format. And they're able to spit out results from overbought and oversold areas based on ATR, Bollinger Bands, RSI, and a few other criteria. And it's actually working really, really, really well. So it's really exciting to see what the future has in store for this particular trading strategy. But now you can see this is a real trading account. This is how it works. Each trade is tabulated. Then you get your results at the bottom. What's your average win? What's your average loss? And how often do you win? And how often do you lose? Because that creates the profit factor, which is extremely important. This one's 5.59. Anything above two is really, really good. And then your expected payoff is 233. It means on every time I take a trade, I can expect to make about $233 on average. Okay. So this is a realistic example, well, a live example of the trading strategy that's being put into place and not just a screenshot of somebody saying, Hey, look, I made money trading. It's verifiable. It's real and it's dated and you can track it back. That's the difference. So if anybody ever shows you a picture, take it a step further, ask them for proof. Ask them to show it, ask them to take a live trade and ask them to make sure that they are verified, right? At the end of the day, they're trying to sell you something. They're trying to show you something. Um, there are too many people that are just marketers and false profits on this stuff. So and the information is there. If you ask and they don't want to show you, it's in their best interest to show you, right? How, how could that not help their case? If you ask them to see something and they say no, well, you have your answer right there. So keep that in mind. Okay, moving on. We've got ourselves the entire crypto market cap space. Now, some of you may not be interested in crypto. Some of you may not be paying attention to it. Some of you may be right into it. I don't particularly care. At the end of the day, cryptocurrencies is an asset class. Futures is an asset class. Equities, an asset class. Forex, an asset class. Treasuries, an asset class. Anything that you can make money on is an asset class. Real estate, guess what? Asset class. Okay. Alternative investments. I don't care if it's a Picasso painting, art, an asset class. Anything that you can buy and then you can sell later for more money is an asset class. And cryptocurrencies is no exception. Yes, cryptocurrencies are extremely volatile. They tend to move. Recently, the crypto market has just seen a 50% sell off. But once you understand the market, once you understand why it's so volatile, because it's so nascent, once you understand the technology that it's bringing, once you understand the real problems that it's going to fix, which if you remember is one of our key steps, identifying problems is the key to wealth. Well, cryptocurrencies are identifying a lot of problems and blockchain technology is the solution to those problems. So they go hand in hand. If you're not playing in the crypto space because you lack understanding or because you just don't believe in it, 
It just simply means that you lack the education. It means that you haven't been taught. And if you haven't been taught, you need to stop right now and get into it because it is not too late to get involved. Think of all of the people that you know, and then think of how many people actually understand the technology behind it, right? And once you come up to one, two, or maybe zero, then it means that you can be at the forefront of the next wave of investments, right? Institutional investments are just starting to pull in. This is absolutely the best time to get involved. Now, I'm not telling you to go in and put your house on, uh, refinance your house and put all your money into Bitcoin. But I, well, if anything, I'd be suggesting other things than Bitcoin. But I am saying that this is something that you should start paying attention to. And if you have a portfolio, it may not hurt to allocate certain resources to different blockchain projects that are looking to fix real problems. Now, the reason I'm showing you this chart is because this is a very, very important period in my personal journey. So from 20, 2017 to today, 2021, well, almost halfway through 2021, a very important part of my life in getting to that end game status. So the decisions that I've made during this process is essentially why I'm able to have said that I've reached my end game, right? So going at the complete left, you can see the Manitoulin Island properties. It just helps to kind of paint when that happened in terms of a timeline. So the investment in the Manitoulin properties, the pre-construction penthouse, that happened about March or February, 2018. Uh, the house that I had purchased, that first house was about 2017. Um, and again, so moving on, moving on, you've got 2019 down here. That's when I was essentially living in Australia. Crypto markets were very, very low. I got paid on a monthly basis in Australia. So while the markets were really low, I reinvested on every monthly paycheck, not entire paychecks, but again, I actively dollar cost averaged into the market and then carry on, we carry on. We get to 2020, buy a little bit more on the crash and then things keep going up. These Red rectangles represent times where I've withdrawn from the cryptocurrency portfolio or my investments. There are so many people, especially online, that essentially say that they've made millions of dollars in crypto or they've done this or they've done that. And at the end of the day, it's just laughable because if that were the case, where's the proof, right? Blockchain technology is by definition trackable, 100% of it. And if you're preaching that you did this and you're preaching that you did that, why don't you just show the people, give them your wallet address, show them a real transaction that you're doing. There's no harm in doing that. So that's why every one of these purchases, I will show you what I've done with it. I will show you the withdrawals from my crypto portfolio. And like, they, it's just a real thing. There's nothing to be ashamed of. I, I do not have $10 million in the bank. Okay. So if you're looking for somebody who has $10 million in the bank, that's not what I have. When I do accumulate a good amount of money, 50,000, 100,000, 150,000, I find projects to reinvest them in and to essentially diversify in line with my end game goal, right? And the end game goal is again, that passive income on a monthly basis, plenty to cover all of my expenses and give me enough money to pretty much do whatever it is that I want to do, go where I want to go, buy what I want to buy, right? That's my end goal. So for now, it takes us to the second phase where it's reinvesting into three commercial buildings, which is roughly 20 apartments in Quebec. So this takes us to this. Note, if I didn't withdraw my money here, this second withdrawal, I would have a significant amount of wealth by the time this third withdrawal took place. But how was I supposed to know that the market was just going to keep going another fourfold from that area? I didn't. I had purchased at a bunch of low areas and I was quite happy with those purchase levels. Had I held on to that amount of money to the third red rectangle up here, that would be millions of dollars. I didn't do that. But it's again, it's fine because I had no idea that this is going to happen, right? It could have easily tanked from this section to the other section. I did buy more and then we'll talk about that after. But for now, let's talk about these buildings and diversifying. So you're trading, you're investing in crypto, and then I show you this beautiful commercial building, okay? Not very pretty. I understand that. It is not pretty whatsoever. But at the time, the crypto market was rallying. My investments were going really well. And the more as time progressed, the better I was becoming at trading, right? So this was 2000, this was October, 2020. So I had just got back to Canada. I remember I had left Australia because COVID. I took that opportunity with trade doctors, started working with them, doing some consulting, doing some mentorship. And I was looking for something to reinvest. So my crypto portfolio at the time had gone fairly, fairly significantly high, I guess you can say, relative to my other assets. And I knew it was time to pull out some money. Now, for me to, to do that meant that I would obviously have to cash out. But what was I going to cash out 
into. I wasn't just going to hold in cash. I wanted to reinvest into something. Um, long story short, at the time, uh, my brother had, had built a very successful mechanical business uh, out of the garage in the house in Sudbury. But he quickly realized that if he can't take any time off, if he took time off, there was no income. If he left for two weeks, there's no income. If he just didn't feel like working for two days, there was no income. So he realized that, yes, he had the independence and the freedom to kind of do whatever he wants to do. But if he stopped working on any given day, that was literally, you know, three to $500 that day that he didn't make. So he didn't really feel as free as he thought he was going to feel. So my brother is a very, very talented man. Uh, he can, he's a contractor. He's a mechanic. He can do plumbing, electrical, or renovation projects. And you pretty much, he's as handyman as it gets. So I thought to myself, well, here's a guy who's not too happy doing whatever he's doing, and he's my brother, and I've got some money on the side that I can essentially buy these beat up, whether they're commercial buildings, whether they're houses, maybe we want to get into house flipping or something like that. And, uh, and that's pretty much how the whole thing started. So we got out the conversation. He said, yeah, I'd be interested in going the contractor route and kind of seeing how, uh, you know, trying my hand at that. And so... I did a lot of research on the Statistics Canada website. So Statistics Canada gathers, as you know, statistics from all over Canada. And one of the reports is actually a vacancy rate. So it tells you how many apartments are available in a given region. What I noticed is that uh, there's a region in Canada called Outaouais, which is basically around the Ottawa area, but on the Quebec side. And that region has one of the lowest vacancy rates I'd ever seen. That means that there are no apartments for rent, like none. People want to stay in this area because it is absolutely beautiful. There are falls, there are the Laurentian colors. Um, it, it's, it's as Canada as it gets if you want to really get a label on it. The weather is mild. It, it's just a really beautiful place with fresh rivers and a lot of rich history. And at the end of the day, good place to live. People don't really want to, live, want to leave and they want an apartment to rent. And that's only became obvious once, of course, I spent some time in the area to, to really understand why is it that people don't want to leave. So using the statistics, I obviously go back into the realtor database. I find several buildings that are available for sale in different areas. And I find this gem available in mansfield et pontefrac which is a community just outside of Pembroke or Ottawa, but on the Quebec side. And uh, this thing pretty much looked abandoned. Uh, there was one tenant living in it. Don't know how that was possible. Probably shouldn't be the case. Um, but it was really run down, right? The, the back end had been leaking for a long time. Uh, it was really just a rough looking building. And I thought it was perfect. Um, I'll hire my brother as a contractor. I'll pay him to do the work. I will bring in all of the building material directly from China as an import. And again, this is another side business, but essentially uh, ordering the material directly from China through containers, either Taiwan, China, or India, depending on what you're looking for, but bringing it in directly by sea getting that obviously over to the property in Quebec. COVID obviously caused a little bit of a delay there, but ended up getting it. I can show you guys tons of pictures on the material and stuff like that, really high grade quality stuff and um, bringing it over. And that's what we use for the material. So saved about 60 to $70,000 in building costs, had my brother be the contractor. And this essentially can turn into eight apartments, uh, currently at six apartments that are rented. So doing really well and uh, pretty much a self, self-sustaining thing, created a Facebook group so that people can manage themselves in terms of tenants, but people generally keep to themselves. So that's where a lot of the money from the crypto space was reinvested into. So I cashed out of the crypto. Well, not all of it, obviously, always leaving some behind. Cashed out a good chunk of the crypto to bring down the balance, reinvested in a real tangible property that could essentially generate that end game goal of around $8,700 a month when it's at full capacity. Okay, so this was building number one. And it's titled building number one because being on site. So you have to imagine, I'm, I'm literally that big window that you see there with the four windows. There, that's, a, that's actually a fairly nice living room, probably the nicest room in the entire building. And uh, it's got a beautiful view of the uh, Coulange River just in front. It's got, it's a nice spot. It's probably my, one of my favorite rooms out of the, all the places that I've ever stayed. So I'm sitting down, I'm doing signals, I'm doing trading analytics, I'm doing a lot of mentoring. But at the same time, that only takes about three or four hours a day. The rest of the day is spent renovating with my brother. I figured I'd use it as an experience because I'm quite handy with, um, you know, with finance, with maths, with anything like that. But when it comes to hands on, um, I'm a good laborer, but I didn't really know anything about electrical or plumbing or carpentry or anything like that. And, I thought it was a really great opportunity to learn that stuff. So I probably bit off a little bit more than I can chew. And I thought it was going to be a lot faster. But I essentially did this for seven months straight, uh, pretty much day in and day out, working with my brother on different parts of the building, 
and all in the hopes of trying to get it to look like this. So this was the 3D model. So during that time, I learned how to use an architectural program. Uh, really easy to use once you get your measurements down. But this is the stuff that I ordered. So the red bright tin from China, the nice solid grade and um, tin roof, the bricks, the slates. Uh, I've got some composite decking coming through. So a lot of this stuff was part of my renovation budget. And that's the goal. So we're trying to essentially get it to down to look like this. Okay. That's the goal of building number one. And we're calling it Hotel Davidson. Now, through this experience, you're on site, you're in a local community. It's not very big. The entire region is about 3,000 people. You obviously get to talk to a lot of people. And so another opportunity came about. So once people found out that I invested in that building, they came and said, hey, maybe you'd be interested in another building. Now I saw online, this was not online. This was not available on a realtor website. This was strictly through word of mouth. Uh, one of the person, well, the owner essentially was in prison. Uh, it was a distressed sale. They wanted to get rid of it, something like that. At the end of the day, it was $30,000 for five apartments. That's what I saw. $30,000, five apartments. It, it's, it's a no-brainer, right? So at the time, but again, a lot of that money that I had spent on the other building, that came out of my crypto budget. I didn't really want to hit the crypto budget again. So what I did is I ended up putting this on a line of credit, the same thing that I had done with the Manitoulin properties. I figured, well, $30,000, that's nothing. Five apartments, that yields about $2,200 a month in revenue, more than enough, like far more than enough to offset the interest charge of the line of credit. And I'll put away $20,000 on the side, just for renovation budget eventually. I didn't have the $20,000 at the time. And so, but this was going to be a project that I tackle after the first building, right? So that's pretty much where we were at with this place. Then another opportunity comes about because the markets kept climbing. So remember that first purchase in October, 2020, that was essentially that Hotel Davidson, that big red building. And then the market kept going and it kept going and it kept going and it kept going. And then because it kept going, my balance grew. So I did have enough money to put it into another investment that came about. This building that can host 10 apartments was $35,000. And again, remember that the vacancy rate is 0% in this area. It means we have a list of over 30 people that are waiting for an apartment. It means getting people an apartment in this area is not an issue. Get it built, get it fixed, and the people will come. The, you'll have them filled in the first week that you're there. As soon as you put a for sale sign that says sold, and you can put a sign that says making apartments and you're going to get a sign. And there are regions like this all over Quebec, all over Ontario, and, and probably the rest of Canada. And if you're in Europe and stuff like that, look for the regions and the rural areas that people don't want to leave. People don't generally have a whole lot of money in that area. So with a mild investment, like you can see here, 35,000, you can pick them up, put some renovations into it, turn them into apartments and keep working towards that end game goal of generating that monthly cash flow that's plenty to pay off all your bills and have plenty left over to pretty much do with it, anything that you want to do. So again, this is pretty much the same story, different, you know, same story, different pile on this one. So that was building number three. Um, again, that market kept going, right? So markets going up, markets going up, markets going up. Cash flows are decent. Rental incomes are starting to come through now. I've got a few of the apartments rented. So cash flow is not really an issue. And yet here comes another opportunity. So this one is uh, probably one of my more exotic plays. I don't like the idea that those three commercial buildings are all found in one rural area in Quebec. And um, that is very concentrated for my liking. I like the idea of being able to invest in different parts of the world, whether that be um, South America, whether that be Europe. And so same kind of story with that pre-construction condo project that came about. I got an email or I'm not too sure if I was browsing or a friend sent me something. But at the end of the day, this was an opportunity to buy a pre-construction condo in a place called Georgia. Now, we're not talking about Georgia, United States. This is Georgia, the country. And admittedly, I had no idea... I had never heard of Georgia, the country before. And so I researched Georgia naturally, and I found out that Georgia is actually really close to Turkey and really close to, well, Turkey, and you got Iraq down there. Not, you know, they're not exactly selling the whole geographical area of it. However, the one beautiful part is that the Black Sea was right here. So the Black Sea is a pretty big deal. And once you start looking into the history of Batumi and Georgia as a country, and you found out it's pretty much a war-torn country, uh, a lot of conflict in the past, but that was like 10, 15 years ago. So it's been settled down ever since. And when people start to look at Georgia on a map and they see its proximity, 
to places like Syria, Iraq, Baghdad, they start to think, wow, that must be really unsafe. Interestingly, Georgia is the 10th safest country in the world, according to the crime index. Canada is on number 55. So Canada is on number 55 in terms of it's not that safe compared to Georgia, who's at number 10. Okay, so the crime index rate factors everything. Of course, you can look it up online, but Georgia is actually one of the safest places in the world. And ironically, it's actually the Las Vegas of Eastern Europe. So Turkey, and this is again, part of the research process, right? Turkey is a huge country and it has a huge, I guess you could say yearn for gambling. However, Turkey, in Turkey, gambling is illegal, cannot do it. But the border of Turkey and Georgia is only about 15 minutes away. So 15 minutes, you can get into Georgia and Georgia has over 20 different casinos in the area. So it's basically, they call it the Las Vegas of Eastern Europe. And it is packed in the summertime with tons of people because of the coastal beaches. It's beautiful. The climate is beautiful. There's lots of cafes and it is a booming spot. So as an investment opportunity, and this was a conservative play for me, I figured that, you know, a five to 10 year play on something like this would be amazing. That the, it would definitely appreciate because I could buy it brand new, $58,000 and it would be um, furnished. And also it came with property management at 15%. So they would handle all the in and out like a hotel. They would handle the cleaning. They would handle everything. And then they would pay me. Um, they basically come up with about 65% was the return that I would get on a yearly basis. So on 65% is what they calculate. Uh, even if it's 20% or 30%, I'm completely fine with that because at this stage, getting closer to that end game, it's the fact that I can now go vacation in a place like this and go visit my own spot and not have to get a hotel, kind of go in, visit my own spot, and of course, rent it out and know that I'm diversified a little bit in terms of real estate. Again, at this point, I had just bought the three buildings. Cash flow was looking low. Okay, so cash flow was looking low. I did not want to dip into any more of the crypto portfolio. So I left the crypto portfolio balance in there. I had a really good cash flow between the mentorships that I was doing, between the trading that I was doing, between the rental income from those buildings that were coming in. My cash flow on a monthly basis was pretty good. So this was an opportunity because they, they, they required zero deposit to be able to get in on this pre-construction. I think you can still get into this pre-construction online if you look it up. This particular thing is still being constructed as we speak. In fact, and this is my one of my favorite parts, you can actually see their live cam of the building being built. So this isn't something that I had seen before. So when you take a look at this, this is a live feed of the actual condo being built and it's live right now. So right now, because of where it's located, it's still nighttime. But in a few hours, you'll see the sunrise come up and then that entire stretch over here is all ocean fronts. So this thing is right on the ocean. They're building, I think, floor 24 right now. The condo that I got is on floor 19. And it's just a really cool way of, of being able to, to track the progress of your condo uh, because more, it's from, especially from that far across the world, it's really difficult to track things, right? Um, in fact, one of the probably the most interesting experiences I've ever had to do uh, was go through a formal sales contract in uh, that language. So this is what the contract looks like. It's, um, I don't even know what language that is. I think it's Turkish. That's a thing. And it basically goes through and outlines the payments that you need to make. So you make the first payment of 2425 and each monthly payment of 2425 American, by the way, uh, you make equal payments for 21 months, 22 with the deposit, and that's it. It's own free and cleared. That's the terms of the actual purchase. No need to make a deposit. No need for interest. There is no interest. You just make equal payments at 24.25. So if you've got good cash flow coming in and that's a payment that you can tolerate, this is a fantastic opportunity. Um, and that's, that's what I did on that side. And that's how I'm able to afford that particular property. So again, completion date scheduled for around December, 2022. Uh, that'll be a really fun spot to go visit. I've never been to Georgia. Um, but again, these are the types of investments that do well for my palates. I'm completely fine with these kinds of investments, right? And that was pretty much the last property for a while. So then what happened is something I thought that would have never happened. Uh, crypto kept going up even more. So if you take a look at this investment over here, this is when I pulled out to buy those three buildings. The probably, I don't know, I think at the time, maybe 40 or 50,000 left in the crypto portfolio. Uh, I didn't want to take in any more. I wanted to see leave it in there because you can't obviously take advantage if you take everything out. So I left an amount of money in there. But when I left that money in there and then this started to happen, it's 
it, it was pretty overwhelming because this is exponential growth, right? So this was a steady growth, steady growth. But then when you get to down here, this is exponential. So the market to go from around 350, 400 billion to over 2.2 billion is huge. So even the remaining balance that I had in that cryptocurrency portfolio, and the returns at this point dwarfed my trading returns. And trading returns are still quite good, but nothing compared to this portfolio, right? And uh, at the time, it was getting a bit nerve wracking. So again, I'm not going to say that I have nerves of steel. Whenever my capital or my accounts get to a certain extent, I tend to make uh, rash decisions. I'm not really thinking logically because we're talking about some significant amount of money, uh, at least concentrated in a small area and something so volatile like crypto, which within a day, as you've seen, it could just disappear. So um, the next the next screen is essentially a ticket from this is dated April 10th. And uh, it's just really important to note that this is April 10th and I'm going to Costa Rica. OK, so you can see at the bottom here, uh, San Jose, Costa Rica, leaving Toronto, uh, April 10th. And this is really important because this is proof of my actual trip to go to Costa Rica with the intention of buying a coffee farm. Because again, a lot of people look at this and when you tell them that you cashed out just before the dip, they don't believe you. So social proof, I always want to make sure that this, you uh, you know that everything that I'm saying in this presentation is genuine, everything is true, and it's verifiable. And so this is a social proof of the 10th of April ticket, but what did I go buy for that? And here it is. So it's 120 acres of Costa Rica mountain property. It has its own waterfall. It's got two or three water springs on the property. I don't remember exactly how many springs because there's so many, but it is an absolute gem of a property. I loved it. Um, I'd, originally, I think they wanted something like 200 some thousand for it. I ended up getting it for about 115,000 plus closing costs. So it comes up to about 120,000. And this was my most favorite purchase out of everything. Now, this absolutely has to do with end goal. But the properties on their own are plenty for end goal. This is absolutely about just living. This is fun. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, developing this land in terms of growing coffee, growing bamboo, lavender. Um, I want to build 10 small cabins on there for tourists that it can be eco-centric. I want to be able to give the workers that work the land some plots of property so that they can actually belong to the community. A lot of big plans on this one. But this is not part of my income. So where it's saying monthly revenue, hey, it's going to make some money, for sure going to make some money. We're, gonna, we're literally building and developing the property right now. Oh, well, I'm not the workers there. The person in that picture, his name is Grieven. And uh, again, people show you the pictures and you know it's, it's plausible, it's doable, but more than the pictures, I want to take you there. All right, so now we're walking to the river. Or sorry, not the river, the, uh, the actual waterfall. And it's just beside here. So there's a bunch of fruit or tomatoes here. I don't know what that's from. Oh, as you can see, I'm very happy we bought these boots because last time I was here, it was it was pretty muddy, but it hadn't rained for four days straight. So now it's rained for four days straight, and uh, we're walking. So, well, yes, hey. He's happy. He's happy. Look how happy he is. Me gusta mucho cuando están feliz. Para electricidad? Para qué? Oh, en la piscina. Oh, podemos? Yeah. Oh, porque la cascada es nuestro, de la propiedad. No es uh, para con. Oh, okay, okay. Ah, okay. Amazing! Yes. So, I wasn't too sure to be honest, but now that I'm seeing this, like, look at this! Look at this thing! So it's literally the uh, the entire cliffside. I don't know if the pictures do it justice. Oh, yeah. Alex, gracias, amigo. Just, it's, uh... oh. Oh, uh, video. Sí, video. Oh, video. Okay. Está grabando. Para verlo desde arriba. 
Okay, so I thought that was really important to kind of go through because this is not just somebody photoshopping somebody else's body inside something beside a waterfall. This was legit in Costa Rica. This was the real flight. This is the real property. This is something that I did purchase. Now, the only thing that's missing is a transaction record of the actual purchase. And you can see from the actual top right, Benjamin, you can see the withdrawal that I took for this particular purchase dated April 16th, April 20th. This is probably about a week or two before the crash, um, the 50% Bitcoin crash. So I was extremely fortunate. Again, the whole reason that I was looking to buy something is because the market was increasing, was increasing. And I thought that, you know what, it's, it's time to pull out at least the, the account has grown again. And uh, there's enough money in there to at least buy a decent property. And so let's take some of the money out and then let's go ahead and buy. So there's still the same amount of money. I generally leave around 50,000 in the crypto portfolio. And whenever the, market, the money grows, I take it out and I try to buy something with it, right? So that is pretty much the only way that I see uh, that makes sense in terms of buying and selling crypto is that have an end game goal. You can't, if you just plan in your mind that more, 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 I'm going to buy some crypto and it's going to go up and I'm going to buy more. And there are people that literally say, I will never sell crypto. I will never sell crypto. Well, that makes no sense at all. If you're making amount of money, and you double, triple, quadruple your account, don't be greedy, pull out your money or at least your initial capital, reinvest it somewhere else to make it go to work, and then you can capitalize on those earnings and on that growth. So that's what I did on this one. So this is about a hundred, about $120,000, $130,000. I took out the money to be able to buy the properties and that's the goal and that's really the point. So all of this to say that you need to have a very clear vision of what you want to do. These, I didn't know three years ago that I was going to be buying a coffee farm in Costa Rica. I didn't know that I was going to come across a condo deal to buy on the Black Sea. I, I had no idea that I, I was going to be offered an opportunity to buy two additional commercial buildings once I was on site in Mansfield and Pontefract. These are not the things that you can plan for. These are opportunities that present themselves that give you new information. And it's what you do with that new information, how you adapt, how you change directions that are going to make the difference between you kind of coming out on top and getting to that end goal or just kind of staying the same consistent path and not really taking any kind of leg up on anything else. If you're not going to be proactive and you're always going to be reactive, then you're never really going to get ahead, right? So that's just something that I want to kind of keep in mind. So for me, now I'm you know, very humbled by the opportunity to be able to give this presentation today. I never thought that it was going to be this fast. In my mind, I always had a really ambitious goal of, you know, 40 years old, maybe as to be able to retire. And, and now that's, you know, I'm just, just past 30. It's something that is really humbling. And it's something that I just, I love, obviously, the idea to be able to help my family. I love being able to help my friends. And, but most of all, I kind of love being able to help people that haven't had a mentor. And um, I didn't exactly have a great mentor growing up or anything like that, but I was fortunate enough to have several professional mentors, whether that was in my career, whether that was in um, investments or whether that was my trading mentor, Giuseppe, to start things off, even to point me in the right direction to say, go read this book by Dr. Dan Tharp, go read this book by David Halsey, go read this book by Joe DiNapoli. Even to have those directions are it is just so valuable that you can't really get ahead without doing that. So and instead of just being on your own and not having that kind of support, it's really beneficial for to be able to accept help 
at least in the form of suggestions from people who are true market experts, right? People's opinions, your family's opinions, and your friends' opinions. Generally speaking, you'll come to them with an idea. And unfortunately, more often than not, it's going to be met with uh, their own self-talk, right? Some negative things, what could go wrong with it instead of what could go right with it. And it tends to discourage a lot of people. So I always say, do your own research, stick within your own risk tolerance. At the end of the day, if you've got the information, you've got your probabilities of something working out, then just do it and just jump. And at the end of the day, you'll miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And if you ask any of the old people that are on their deathbed what they regret the most, generally speaking, it's not taking enough risks because that's the stuff that you remember when you're uh, on your deathbed, so they say. Tons of memoirs have said the same thing. It's all about not seeking opportunity, playing it too safe. They wish that they just went for it because at the end of the day, you figure it out, right? So what's next for me in terms of uh, since the end game is all there? Um, well, recently, I am literally going through the final transactions of selling those properties. So I'm going to finish off selling those three properties. That's going to give me a, a massive amount of money. I think it's come up with about 300000 of cash. And I think I've got about 80000 uh, left over to pay on those properties from that Desjardins loan I talked about. But after clearing that, it's going to give about 300000 in cash. And that's more than I generally have on cash available, not invested somewhere else. So I will use a big chunk of that to reinvest into the coffee farm to start building those cabins and clearing it off aggressively uh, and start investing in the machinery that I need to actually process the coffee on that farm. And, and obviously play around with the blockchain technology and supply chain management. And I want to kind of use blockchain to track the crops, tons of different ideas. But now I can actually do those because... There's going to be plenty of capital to be able to take my time, focus on that project, help out where I can. And that's kind of what I want to do. And at the end of the day, once you clear the debt, you got to reinvest the rest, right? I'm not just going to hold that amount of money in cash somewhere else. This is a perfect opportunity to reinvest into crypto for my side, for my own risk tolerance. Bitcoin has just taken a 50% hit literally a couple of days ago. We are currently in a flat consolidation zone. So people are not too sure if it's going to go lower and they're not too sure if it's going to bounce from here and people are nervous. And this is my favorite time to get involved because when there's blood on the streets, it's time to get really greedy. And that's kind of Warren Buffett's favorite saying, which is, you know, the best investor of all time or the Oracle of Omaha. They essentially say that when everybody's nervous and everybody thinks it's the end of the world, it's when you should start stacking and when you should start investing. Unfortunately, a lot of people who were invested, they just go 100% all in. So they don't have any more cash to invest, which is a lesson to you. Always have, whether it's 5,000 or 10,000 on the side, at least 10% of your core portfolio in cash so that you can jump on these sales, right? And that's what this is. It's a sale. The technology hasn't changed. It's just a lot of, um, a lot of blah, blah, a lot of people flooding the markets, a lot of fear, uncertainty, doubt, saying it's over and so on and so forth. So that's my opinion. And that goes for the trading aspect of it as well. Trading regularly as a day trader, you're not fully exposed to the market. You're getting in, you're making a few trades, you're getting out, and you're consistently growing your portfolio, right? And once my portfolio gets to a certain size, same kind of concept as my crypto portfolio, I don't do well with large, large capitals. So keeping my portfolio around 50 to 100,000, that's my sweet spot. Once it grows beyond that, it doesn't work well for me. I take it out and I reinvest it somewhere else and I go back down to the regular size. And that's all I'm going to do. So now, since we have entered the end game, it's really time for fun stuff. Not to say that the rest of it wasn't fun. It was. But now it's time to really kind of take the time and, and relax and kind of enjoy the process, build the family, uh, spend time with the family and do all that fun stuff, right? And keep learning and do different things. So with all of that being said, it really comes down to what your end game is. Um, there's a famous saying that's um, one of my favorite quotes, a goal without a plan is just a wish. It's basically useless. It's pie in the sky. If you don't tabulate what you want, if you don't actually outline it, if you don't have a goal or you don't even have to have step by steps of how you're going to get there, because like you just saw, I had no clue that I was going to come into the opportunity to buy those buildings, buying those condos, investing in crypto when I did. I don't know when a crash is going to happen, right? I'm not a clairvoyant um, fortune teller. I don't know these things. But what you can do is be prepared to capitalize on opportunities when they present themselves. And of course, be ready for the opportunities. But the number one thing that you got to do after you set your goals is you got to educate yourself. Then you commit, then you fail, and you fail often, you fail fast, and you learn from your mistakes. You keep going, you persevere, you systemize, and then you just copy and paste that model and keep doing it. Building one, building two, building three, condo one, condo two. And then you just keep growing it from there. But the most important thing in this entire track is educating yourself. 
So from our perspective, and, and this is what, this is probably my, one of my favorite courses to do. I literally poured everything that I had in my brain from every pattern that I've ever studied, from every statistic that I've ever learned, from psychology, behavioral finance, from um, quantitative methods, from correlation analysis, literally everything that I've ever learned, whether it was CFA, whether it was CIM or Chartered Investment Manager course, whether it was my you know, almost a decade at CMC Markets working with a broker, and I poured it into this 11 hours of content. And this is not a webinar style. So when you see this essentials course, it's literally scripted. It's over 120,000 words of script. And I wanted to make sure that it flowed and I wanted to make sure that people got their money's worth. So when you sign up for the essentials course, it is a very, very well thought out course that goes through from foundations of knowing absolutely nothing to systematic trading, algorithmic trading, and then so on and so forth. So if you really want to kind of invest in something, this is absolutely the course that I recommend. I mean, I am biased. I put it together, but I think that you know at this point that I have reached my end game. So I want you to be able to, I want to be able to help you get to yours. Uh, and the essentials course is absolutely the, the key pillar in getting a foundation. And, but don't just stop there. Take a bunch of other courses after that, right? Whether it's through trade doctors, whether it's through someone else, take as many courses as you can, because every time I've taken a course, yeah, they haven't always been the best course, but I've always learned at least one thing. And that one thing for me is enough to pay for that course. So that's just my two cents. If you already have some sort of foundation in trading, I still say you'll take the essentials course. There are guaranteed stuff in there that you had no idea about trading. And I highly recommend it. I don't care if you've been trading a year, two years, five years, go take that course. You're going to learn something. Then as a template, I suggest you go take the MT4 Pro Platform course, separate course, about five hours, this one. It will literally teach you everything that you need to know about MT4. MT4 is that platform I showed you earlier. It's got algorithmic trading. It's got um, strategic uh, testing. So let's say that you had a trading strategy in your mind that, oh, I want to buy when moving averages cross, or I want to buy when news comes out, or I want to buy this. You can test all of those systems out through the MT4 platform for free across 10 years of data, if you want, on every individual pl product offered through that platform. And I'll show you a bunch of other premium tools that you can get from your broker that usually you have to pay for and that will actually program trading robots for you. So really, really, really exciting stuff. MT4 is by far probably my, my favorite platform in the world. And it's also a passion project for me. I know it very, very well. So if you ever did have questions, to send them through Trade Doctor and I'd be happy to go through that with you, assuming I'm still there, right? So that's something that you really, really, really want to take to heart. So I'd recommend that one if you're real serious about your algorithmic trading. If you just want to learn how to trade basics, the essentials course will take care of it. If you want to take this a step up and you actually want to learn scalping, you want to learn the tools available to you and you want to go through, take this course. It's obviously less expensive because it's a more specialized course. Uh, and then one of my favorite courses to do, as you can probably tell, is the crypto course. So I put three of these together and that was my contribution to Trade Doctor's curriculum and a library. And the crypto course is by far my favorite. It shows you personal examples of staking. It shows you personal examples of uh, the trades that I've taken, how I went about it, which platform I use, how is it, how to use them, how to go from, uh, how to transfer your cash in, what's the difference between a wallet, uh, what's the difference between a private key, public key, pretty much everything that you need to know. Uh, and just so you kind of have an idea of the format, I'm going to go ahead and play just a quick, I think it's six minutes or five minutes, and it's the staking aspect of cryptocurrencies. So a lot of people think that you can just buy and hold cryptocurrencies, but you can do so much more with decentralized finance. So I'm, I was earning at this point anyway, I was earning 12% interest and it was paid every three days uh, on a cryptocurrency just to buy and hold. And it was being paid in that cryptocurrency. So as it moved up in value, my dividend like returns also increased in value. So really amazing way of generating plenty of cash flow on a monthly basis. So take a look at that. If you ask most people, earning a 4 to 8% dividend is an amazing return in the world of traditional finance. In fact, popular companies like TD Bank and Enbridge pay a handsome dividend every three months. TD Bank pays an annual dividend of roughly 4%, and Enbridge pays a dividend close to 8%. Did you know that you could also earn a dividend type return through cryptocurrencies? In fact, when you receive dividends through stocks like TD Bank and Enbridge, it's usually received in cash. When you receive dividends from crypto, they're also paid in crypto, which has some significant advantages. It's worth noting that the official term is not a dividend for a variety of reasons, but it's called a staking reward in most cases.
When we chatted about Bitcoin earlier, we briefly discussed the concept of proof of work, which is where big, powerful computers spend a great deal of electricity trying to solve complex computer algorithms, which is how they verify transactions. If they're successful, lucky, and fast, they'll receive a reward in the form of a Bitcoin. Hence the term Bitcoin mining. And that's only specifically for the Bitcoin protocol. So nothing new there. However, there are many, many complaints about this since it's horrible for the environment. A new way of validating transactions was created and it's called proof of stake. So proof of stake removes the cost of mining completely. In short, a person can validate block transactions according to how many coins he or she holds. This means that the more Bitcoin or altcoin like Ether or whatnot you own, the more power he or she would have and thus the more staking rewards they would receive. Proof of stake is one of the many different ways of validating a network, but it's one that we're going to focus on, which allows people like you and me to earn interest rewards in the form of additional cryptocurrency, just like we just said, just for holding the cryptos and not doing anything. So let me go ahead and show you how this works with an actual example. But first, let's visit one of the best websites for earning interest in cryptocurrencies. So here we're going to visit www stakingrewards.com and it's going to show us a comprehensive list of all of the coins that'll pay you to simply hold their tokens. Now each one is a little bit different and you have to do something a little bit different but it's well worth the investment of your time. The best part of most of these projects is that you still get to take advantage of the capital gains from the token moving up in value, assuming it's moving up of course. So if you actually like the project and believe it has a long-term potential, you can buy that token and you plan on holding it, you can also stake the token to earn additional tokens. So that's pretty great. This isn't just theoretical, by the way. I've personally done this on several coins, and I'll show you some examples now. So listed near the top of this list is Polkadot, which we briefly mentioned earlier. Polkadot was actually created by one of the founders of Ethereum and has a really impressive team behind them. There's a lot of information about Polkadot online, so I won't get into the differences between DOT and Ethereum right now. What we care about is the money we can receive from simply holding DOT. Now, you can see that Polkadot here pays a really nice double digit return just to stake the coin. But that's not written here that you're going to have to lock up your funds for 28 days. And in the crypto world, that's a way too long if you ask me. So I found a loophole. And there are tons of loopholes in this space. Remember that exchange we discussed earlier, Kraken? Well, my friends, Kraken will let you stake Polkadot directly on their platform, so directly through the exchange, and it's not going to require any lockout period. So I can stake the coin today, start getting paid tomorrow, and then I can withdraw my money anytime. Another big difference between staking cryptocurrencies and receiving dividends from stocks is how often you get paid. In the dividend world, it's usually every three months or so. It could be different, but usually it's once a quarter. In this example with DOT, I received a distribution every three days. Now think about that compound growth. I receive more and more DOTs every three days, and the balance gets bigger and bigger, which means the rewards also get bigger and bigger as those returns are reinvested. But let's go through a detailed example. In this example, I'm staking 1,968 DOT. The interest for staking DOT is, as you see in Kraken, 12% per year. So never mind the value of DOT right now. All I have to calculate is 12% of 1,968 DOT, which is what I have, because remember, the rewards are paid in crypto. So if I'm staking 1,968 DOT, I'll receive 12% or 236.16 dot at the end of the year. And that's if I was distributed one time at the end of the year, but we know I get distributed every three days. So let's say the dot token right now grew in value to a very conservative $20 per coin at the end of the year. The original portfolio was worth $31,488. And that was pricing at $16 per token, just to keep things simple. So dot trading at $16 per token, me having 1,968 dots, that equals, and easy to calculate, 
$31,488 American. That's what it's worth. Now, if the value moves up and it goes to $20 per token, those 1,968 tokens are now worth $39,360, which represents a capital gain return of roughly 25%. So that's pretty great. In terms of interest or reward return, I earned 236.16 dots, which you remember we calculated earlier. Now, if dot is currently worth $20, like we're saying it is, those 236 dots essentially give me an extra $4,723.20. The total value of the account is now $44,083.20. Now that total return comes up to about 40%. So let's say that again. One year ago, I had 1,968 dot. I received about 236 dots for holding that investment for one year. I got lucky and the investment only went up about $4 from $16 to $20, which by the way, that can happen in one day in this space. And then at the end of the year, when I calculate how much my investment is worth, it's gone up to about $44,083.20, which again is a 40% return. Now that's after the first year. So let's say on the second year, again, I leave it in there and I receive another 12%, but this time, the token stays fixed at $20. Let's just pretend it never ever moves. Well, now you're essentially expecting roughly $440 per month in American dollars or $565 Canadian every month just for holding that token. Now, again, in that later example, I'm just assuming that Polkadot stays at $20 per coin. Naturally, in the space, the growth is, is phenomenal. But let's just say it stays fixed at $20. I leave the $44,000 there. I can expect to generate roughly $440 per month American, which is roughly $600 Canadian. Now, a quick reminder that the amount that we could be receiving would be a lot more if we chose to reinvest the rewards by turning on the Grow Rewards feature inside the Kraken account here. What that would do is every three days or so, when I receive the additional dot, as you can see here in the account, Instead of withdrawing, say, those dots in cash, I'm simply adding them to my staking pool. So now I have even more dots that are growing every time and calculating a return based off of that. So this is essentially compounded growth. But unlike things like mutual funds or traditional stock investments, this compounded growth happens every three days. Okay, so that's essentially a little bit of a snippet on the cryptocurrency course. Again, that is one small video and there are tons of different videos about staking, about lending your crypto, about borrowing your crypto. If you had $50,000 worth of Bitcoin, you could literally borrow an additional 25,000 and, and just for putting up your Bitcoin as collateral. So there's so many different things that you can do in this space. It's a very exciting space. Uh, again, I highly recommend the course if you haven't taken a course on cryptocurrencies. Uh, and again, it really depends on what your end game is, right? What is your end game and what's your goal? Are you looking for uh, cryptocurrencies? Are you looking for MT4? Are you looking for a complete trading solution? Are you looking for a mentor? What are you looking for? On our side, and what we tried to do, well, actually what we've been doing um, for 18 months now is premium signals group. And this is done through our Telegram group. So it's offered and we have a channel for English, channel for French, uh, demand is increasing for Spanish. So we might open up another channel for Spanish, but 18 consecutive months of proven and transparent positive returns and counting. Now, again, these are signals that we send on a daily basis and usually were sent between 8 a.m. and 12 p.m. And they're on all kinds of classes, right? So they can be on crypto, they can be on stocks, they can be on Forex, they can be on commodities like oil and gold and silver, natural gas, wheat, so on and so forth. So there are a lot of different signals that are sent. Usually we send between three and five signals per day. And again, all of those returns can be verified through the Telegram group. So what you see on the phone in front of you right now, that's the Telegram app on your phone. You can also access it via desktop. Um, but all of the signals have been real signals and they're included in most of our premium trading packages. What that means is that if you subscribe to a trading package, you get access to these signals for free. Now, just to kind of show you a little bit of the trading package, 
Um, this is what the Telegram group looks like. So right now, I'll just scroll up a bit just to show you. So we saw those from the phone. So I'm accessing this from my desktop, right? So it essentially shows you the different groups that you have. It has daily updates. It tells you when to sell, when to close. It tells you, okay, well, at this point, close half of your profits. Uh, we have a good, decent move. Like this is Bitcoin, for example. We bring the stop loss to the entry price here and let the, obviously, the capitals grow. You can see the difference between the blue and the pink here, just like we covered in our active trading examples. Always trying to go and achieve more than what we risk. Uh, sometimes we get straddles. That's all going long and going short at the same time because it's a volatility play. So again, this is just using option strategies in the CFD world. Um, there's a lot of different stuff and we're constantly updating this. So recently we launched our algorithmic signals program. So these are generating a ton of additional signals. All of these are within the last uh, 12 or 15 hours or so. And you can see how many there are, right? So whenever you see huge spikes like this, this is a massive overbought signal. It is highly likely that the price will retrace in the short term. And we use our algorithmic signal to essentially modify based on the current volatility. So whether it's using average true range, it's using Bollinger, they essentially calculate the most probable case for a pullback. Um, and that's where they set the take profit level. And then they set the stop loss level above here. So again, tons of information in those courses so that you actually understand what it is I'm talking about when I'm showing you a chart like this. And again, these signals are on cryptos, on equities, on indices of commodities and, and Forex, of course. So they're quite good uh, in terms of telling you what to do, how long to do it for. But nothing is a substitute to the trading essentials course and the overall packages. If you want to just be told what to do, definitely just sign up for signals if you want. And then you can at least get a feel for it. I don't recommend just doing signals without taking some sort of foundations course. Um, the signals are included in your essentials course anyway. Uh, if you want trading analysis, if you want mentorship, there are uh, certain traders that are available. I've, I'm capped out, so I can no longer take any additional students. There is just no more time to be able to do that. Um, but there are other traders that may be available to take you on as mentorship. Uh, and again, that would be part of the inner circle package. So there's about a bunch of different things that the trade doctors have on their website to be able to help people. But at the end of the day, they figure we're doing trading anyway. We may as well just systemize it to show people what it is that we're doing. We'll report on it, keep us honest, keep us objective, and we'll go from there. So that's really what that's all about. And that's pretty much what the whole thing was about, right? So now we're going to head back to... To the presentation and at the end of the day, what I want you guys to do now is I want you to go check your mailbox. Inside your mailbox, you're going to receive an email from us with an exclusive offer. So really everything that I've talked to you about, if you've stayed with me, if you understand what I'm trying to say, if you understand the mindset in being flexible in taking advantage of the opportunities when they're there, whether that be in crypto, whether that be in trading, whether that be in real estate, whether that be investing in a friend's business, whether that be storage, I don't really care. Taking a very objective and logical approach to looking at the opportunities that you're presented with, being able to obviously take on the risk sometimes, right? Life has risks. You're going to have to take some risks at some point, regardless of what it is that you're doing. And if you're comfortable with that and you're eager to learn and you really want to learn a new skill set, I highly recommend that you take one of the courses. Again, I can't I can't push enough the importance of taking a package and getting a little bit more of a mentorship. So even if it's not a coaching from one of their agents because nobody's available, at least taking the course and going through systematically from your foundations, moving through your essentials, understanding algorithmic trading and MT4 and the premium tools that come with that. And of course, my most favorite course is the crypto course, um, which basically is the cherry on top. Uh, you should absolutely learn the basics of trading in the essentials course before you start dabbling with crypto because that's a whole different ballgame. Um, but again, that's going to be up to you and what you want to do for your end game. So again, as it stayed, I've already reached my end game. So let us help you reach yours. Now, if you want a special offer, take a look at your email and that will expire. And um, again, the reason for that is because you leave things open ended. It's like a deductible in insurance, right? So if things are free, people don't want to do it. This is kind of the same concept. So that isn't, that will expire. And I believe it's a 48 hour expiration on that email. I have to check with the client service team, but it is a special offer. You've stayed with us this far. You've looked at the course. 
you understand what it is that we're trying to do. And if you're kind of buying into our approach to trading, our approach to investing, and our approach to, I guess, end game in general, this is something that kind of you want, you should be part of. And we kind of want you in our team, right? So go ahead, take a look at all that. If you have any questions whatsoever, you can give us an email. Uh, that's info at tradedoctors.com. Uh, they do not have a line because naturally they are trading throughout the day. Send them an email. They're quite quick to answer. And if you have any questions specifically for me or anything like that, go ahead and send it through uh, and uh, I'll definitely get back to you. So have yourselves a great day. And it was a really big pleasure doing this for you guys today. Really privileged to uh, be able to share my experience with you. Thanks again. Cheers.